Thank you. Well, I have to admit what Gail didn't say is that I'm also a wee lad from Dunedin and therefore a totally unbiased supporter of the Highlanders. Uh, and I should say when we think about evidence to action and you think of what is going to happen on Saturday night. After all, both teams, I mean, for a Dunedin night, can I say there are two, rug two sporting teams that are really <coughs> break your heart when you follow them. One is, of course, the Highlanders, and the second is the New Zealand cricket team. But, however, if you move to Wellington, there's a third one, and it's called the Hurricanes. And, of course, what we know from evidence to action, whenever you go to a Highlanders or a Hurricanes game, you've got about a 60% chance of seeing the finest rugby in the country. And you've got about a 40% chance of seeing the biggest failures that you could ever imagine. So, really, from evidence to action, how can we draw conclusions about a 60% success rate in both for what will happen on Saturday night. Uh, so just introduce a few little a bit of variability. My, my job is, is really um, to, to, firstly, um, you've met three of, the, three of the people on the panel, and I'd like to now in introduce um, Murray Edridge. Uh, Murray has been the Chief Executive of Barnardo's for quite a considerable period of time, and he's now, of course, the Deputy Chief Executive of the Ministry of Social Development in charge of the Children and Young Persons um, Services. Um, and he's, paid, he's an extremely important um, contributor to this in terms of that understanding of both um, social services from evaluation from the community sector point of view and now hard at it in terms of how public policy is, is made. Um, and Dr. Tamashiro Soali is a, is, a, is a very distinctive person involved in um, Pacific and Indigenous evaluation, uh, involved in... in, in um, She's an active board member of Samoa's community mental-based uh, uh, health um, and has played a role in Waitamata District Health Board and the Pacific Health Research Centre at the University of Auckland. And, of course, out from that comes from Samoa, uh, where I believe we're going to see again some fine rugby. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 uh, and Manu Samoa is, is, is going to be a great cook. Again, I think... Uh, evaluation experts will not help us in terms of determining the outcome of that. Well, but we've, got, we've now got... Uh, each of the speakers is going to talk for five minutes on their, their, their general sense, their, 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 the th what, what they most should pick out of this session. Uh, Louise, Tomasolo, Helen, Murray and then Sheridan will talk. And I guess I've just added a little edge to what I hope they might add, which is, which is we've talked a lot about evaluation and understanding populations but, you know, one of the most, and statistics, of course, is the science of error. And, 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 and we really often can only crudely know a little bit about the populations that we end up having to make very exacting policy about. So I want to ask them if they can, in a wee part of their session, talk a little bit about how the general uncertainty we have about populations influences how we use the knowledge we get from evaluation studies, no matter how robust, brilliantly designed, scientifically prepared they appear to be. So, thank you very much. They will start. So, the first speaker is Louise. <laughs> Just a small <laughs> Do you want me to stand or can I sit? You, I you can do what you like. This is a free I country. <laughs> <laughs> so, there's nothing like being given a question and then finding that it's changed when you sit down. <laughs> So I'm not actually not going to properly answer Len's question, but I do have a but I was reading something this morning about um, publication bias. And we've talked a lot today about evidence and using evidence. And there's some really shocking statistics about how infrequently research that finds negative results or no impact doesn't actually ever get published. And so I think it's a bit of a salutary lesson that the probability of us reading research about things that don't work <laughs> and things that fail is quite low. So that's my attempt to answer your second question, Len. But I had a few points that I wanted to make that really picked up on um, through the day and, and reflections on the, the question that was posed about um, how do we know whether we're making an impact. So I'm going to be a little provocative because I think it's my job as an outsider because I'm leaving the country on Thursday, so I'll get away with it. <laughs> So I think if we really were honest with ourselves, we might have a little bit of a reality check and get a little bit more sceptical about our ability to actually make an impact. I think we often believe that we can have a greater effect than we actually can. Mm. We often try to affect far too many outcomes. And if we were being honest to ourselves, we also get very good at retrofitting outcomes into the latest, I don't know, po policy call or initiative. So the first thing I would make a plea for is a little bit of scepticism and a reality check 
and perhaps be a bit more modest when we're trying to make an impact. Maybe look at making an impact on one or two outcomes rather than 15, because we know from the research that that just isn't possible. So that's my first um, provocative statement, which I'm very happy to have some comments about. Um, the second is I think we could get a bit smarter about using evidence when we're designing our interventions. I'll give you a really good example. I was approached recently by someone saying, right, we've got this fantastic idea for a mentoring programme. And it really struck me that the place that they'd started with was the intervention and they hadn't started with the outcome that they were wanting to achieve. And even just a cursory look at the evidence about what mentoring can and can't do suggested that their idea was already doomed because there was no evidence to suggest that mentoring could affect the thing that they were interested in. So I think we could really do ourselves a favour when we're still at the design phase of just making better use of the evidence that's out there as we're shaping and forming new um, initiatives that would give us a greater probability of having an impact on the outcomes we're after. The third thing, a little bit more uh, provocative, is I think we've got to try and get away from our sort of project slash initiative um, mentality. Um, all of the evidence that I'm seeing about the levels of need in populations suggests that we get, need to get a bit more ambitious and go for some real scale. Mm. And we don't get scale by little projects and little initiatives. We get scale by really understanding the prevalence of a difficulty in a population and actually planning an intervention or a range of interventions that's going to have a chance of impacting at the population level. And we get away from these little itty bitty projects that will only ever chip away at the side. I think we could also get into a little bit of uh, continuous quality improvement rather than always looking at evaluation that comes at the end. So if I was thinking about my example of incredible years earlier on um, and the target group, I could do a little bit of uh, co continuous quality improvement on seeing whether I'm actually reaching the families I'm supposed to reach and just keep on testing that. If I'm not reaching them, make a little adjustment, test again. So it doesn't have to be about evaluation at the end that tells us whether or not we've been successful, but something that's as we're going along. And my final point is I think we could benefit also from looking at um, the levels of need in communities and revisiting that fairly regularly to see whether we're making an impact. It picks up on um, Sheridan's point from earlier. They've assessed what's going on in the community, derived some priorities. The real ACID test will be going back in three, four years' time, gathering that same data to see whether an impact has been made. So that can be another way that we can get a sense of whether we're making a difference is continuing to examine at the community level, the population level, whether the things that we're selecting we're making an impact on. So that'll be my five points. Talofa, fakalofala hiatu, malo le, nisam bulavinaka, talohani. Um, warm Pacific greetings, it's late in the afternoon and uh, not only has the question changed but my time has been halved. <laughs> so um, we did have initially a, um, it, it, I wasn't quite sure, it's nothing like evaluators who are over prepared, you can't be over prepared as an evaluator in the sense that I, I do have a couple of slides, more than a couple but I'm only going to um, uh, focus on a, on a couple of them Okay, to make my two, three points. Um, and the reason why is uh, we've traversed a whole range of different groups and Dr. Debbie Ryan talked, uh, asked a question of Louise earlier about diversity and one of the key things around Pacifica or Pacific groups in New Zealand is this question of diversity and how do you in the evaluation setting deal with a population group that at the outset is very diverse. Um, and this is a challenge not only for Pacifica or Pacific, but also for Asian and other ethnically pan-ethnic groups that have been put together and assumed to be one group. So the, the notion of um, when we talk about we must do this or we must do that, or when we talk about Pacific and other labels, we have to be very careful as to how it is that we understand these things. So definitions are really, really important. I put this up because it gives you pictures of the diverse experiences and images that are associated with Pacific peoples. But um, a couple of them are really important to, to remember, I think, when, when you're trying to work through issues about doing evaluations with Pacific communities in New Zealand. And one is that there is still a tie between the Pacific peoples in New Zealand, we'll talk about who that constitutes a little later, 
but um, there's still a tie between Pacific peoples and their island homelands, and probably more so than, than the other pan-ethnic groupings that we have under the census. So that's one thing to remember. Number two is that a lot of our Pacific communities um, have been born and raised with second, third, fourth generations here in New Zealand and feel that New Zealand is actually a spiritual home for us. And that has really interesting implications about the type of cultural context, the type of identity issues that these young people or these um, second, third, not so young anymore, um, people uh, in terms of their affiliation with this category Pacific. So diversity is something that is in-house as well as, um, you know, in relation to non-Pacific or, or other. Um, I want, I'm going to keep this slide here because I've got a whole number of other ones, but just in terms of what matters, when we're talking about evidence, and I've been listening to the discussion thus far, and listening to uh, what Louise said uh, in her keynote, an amazing keynote, um, around evidence, and one of the things that I was quite heartened about was when she talked about how evidence is not necessarily, and she didn't say this in so many words, but not necessarily just about data. Um, there is the discussion that needs to be had about around how we deal with the, what's generally been assumed under the category of qualitative knowledge or qualitative information. But the, the notion of feeling something is true, yeah? as opposed to knowing from the systematic processing of information that we've gathered using representative data and all of these tools, but coming out at the end and still feeling, actually, I don't feel that that's right, or I don't feel that that's true, or yes, I do feel that's true. So the, the notion of, of, of evidence and what matters is something that is very much beyond just the data exercise. Also, what I wanted to um, point out is the notion of evidence being culture bound. We've just come out, we being um, a, a whole number of Pacific researchers and evaluators, policy makers um, from across the country on Thursday had a session um, as part of the Australasian Association of Bioethics and Health Law, that's a bit of a mouthful, um, but we got together to talk about Pacific ethics and research and evaluation and one of the things that came out quite strongly is that um, Pacific research, evidence, data, it's all culture bound in many ways. And, and one of the key ways is when you start getting into the issue of interpretation. How do you interpret the data that you have just collected? How do you then prioritize what it is that's going to be disseminated and put out there? And what language are you going to use to explain and communicate the value of that? So all of that sort of stuff is, is really important and we often get uh, caught up in a conversation because we, we being all of us here, are trying to communicate in ways that are going to make sense to each other so that you hear me, I hear you, we hear each other in terms of what we're saying. So we have to share a common language. But within that sharing, one of the things we have to recognise is that we can often use the same words but talk past each other. Okay, we can speak English, but not speak English. Yeah? Um, and so in terms of our uh, conversations with our custodians, we talk, called them uh, cultural custodians, a contested t term in itself. But one of the things that they shared with us, in a Tongan uh, cultural custodian, some of you may know, famous poet, Konaihelu Thaman, um, she talked about the word aunt and being told, if you were told to go pick up your aunt from the airport, now, in Tonga, aunts have various different standings, and you could have a mehetikanga. Have I said that right, Dr. Prescott? Mehetikanga, right, stand corrected. Um, who is actually a special sister of, of a brother. It's a particular relationship, and there are a whole lot of codes and protocols around how you behave around that particular aunt. So if you, did, if you just said the word aunt, it could be anybody, right? But if you said mehetikanga, yeah, then you know immediately what the protocols and the relationships are. So language is actually really important in working through some of these culture bound assumptions. So how do we factor language in our evaluation paradigms when dealing with diversity? So that's something in terms of the um, Pacific aspect. And I'll, I'll just end um, around uh, 
one of the challenges that we have in Pacific evaluation, and that is how to bring everybody together when, um, when about, uh, I think there's 9% of our uh, Pacific population is currently defined by the census uh, uh, modeling, um, are non-Polynesian. <coughs> or even less than that in non-Polynesian. So when we talk about Pacific, we are talking about a Polynesian group, right? We're talking about Samoans who make up just under 50%. Okay, so if you see all the Samoans, we had a panel of uh, Chief Advisor Pacific, and all of them were Samoan. I'm glad to say they were not only just Samoan, but they were Samoan women. Yeah, but they were all Samoan. Now that has implications for the people that are representing Pacific, right? Now a lot of our models, our models for evaluation, our model for models for research, etc., they are Polynesian. They're either Tongan or they're Samoan. So what does that say about all the other voices that are there? So one of the challenges for us is around how we make our pan-ethnic category that we've been labelled or lumped with to some extent, work for us. And two things in terms of, um, I'm gonna go right to the end to say that the kinds of things that we need for our kete or our ato is we need robust uh, data, um, evidence in the broader sense, and we need it to be owned by our people. Thank you. Um, well, I'll try and build on what the two of you, the ideas that you've, you've started really to get us on a, on a roll. I guess some of my reflections, um, I'm, I'm challenged by, by um, Louise's idea of um, sticking with, um, well, I, I agree with the project um, and initiative and getting out of those and, and having a much clearer strategic goal and a longer term vision about what we're trying to do um, and only, and not, but I challenge a bit about um, only doing one thing or a couple of things because I like to, you know, do more. But and so then I was thinking about our discussion we had this morning about the importance of collaboration and how um, actually together we can focus on what we can do well um, and individually we can look at what um, difference we can make, but collectively we can make a bigger impact. And so that would be my way of perhaps trying to reconcile um, the idea of a modest impact because actually I need to do what I can do and encourage other people um, to do what they can, can in their sphere of influence so that um, we're not all, all you know, actually focusing on doing one thing um, but working together. Um, the second thing I guess was my reflection on um, the presentation on the real-time feedback um, that the Maori boys were getting with the, game, with the games and um, how important that is in our world of our cycle between evidence, um, policy and, and practice and how we, we need to continuously feed back the data. And we're looking at that at the moment in terms of, you know, is that in itself contributing to better implementation and outcomes, i.e. Getting, get, getting that information quickly back to <coughs> practitioners so that they can see and, and make changes swiftly. So that, that I think we should make more better use of. And the other thing that your, um, some of your reflections have helped me really think about is I often go back to a paper that I read um, a few years ago by um, Sir, Sir Professor Mason Jury around um, working at the interface um, and how um, science and indigenous knowledge can come together um, um, where they meet and not um, one is not more important or superior than the other but they're each a way of understanding the world and how if we can work at the interface then we can actually get to a stronger uh, better knowledge so that's worth googling um, Kia tato, good afternoon. Um, and my apologies, I've just recently joined you, um, having been somewhere else first today, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, I'm not sure how qualified I am to even sit here and talk about this stuff. Um, I'm, I'm in charge of the money, and um, I'm not quite sure how one becomes in charge of the money. Um, I don't know if you can look back on your careers and say that was a planned <coughs> and deliberate process. For me, it feels somewhat random. But the the rationale and the motivation for me being in the role I am at the moment is the 10 years I've spent in the NGO sector that Len indicated um, in the introduction. And I used to be asked a question regularly as the chief executive of a large NGO saying, what is the biggest challenge you face? And the answer people expected was funding and working with government. But the biggest challenge we faced, and, and I think sector organisations continue to face, is measurement and 
are we being as effective as we can be and how would we know that and I guess you know life has a funny way of, of delivering you um, um, certain results or outcomes and um, I now find myself in a position having sat in the sector for 10 years of having to make some determinations or be involved with conversations about how do we use evidence to justify the things we do to justify also the public money we spend on it and um, you'll all be aware hopefully that on the 4th of June of this year um, the Honourable Anne Tolly launched the Community Investment Strategy and it's something that, that myself and my team and, and Sheridan and others have been out talking about over the last couple of weeks. Now the Minister, unbeknown to us, went on Q&A on Sunday the, twi uh, the 21st of June and from the response I gather some of you saw it. The Minister talked about a social services revolution. It's probably not the ideal burning platform to start a conversation with the sector on. But in actual fact, that's precisely what it is. And we shouldn't shy away from that. And the revolution is not just about what we do, well not only about what we do, but about how well we do it and the way we do things. And for us to know how well we do things, we need to measure, we need to evidence, and we need to have some agreed processes by which we understand the effectiveness of what it is that we all strive to do. Because I have no doubt that everybody that sits in these rooms and also sits in the conference I've, I've been at earlier today absolutely wanted to do the right thing. But how do we ascertain that and how do we evidence that so that in fact when government comes to make decisions around resources and investment, it makes the right decisions in the right way. Now the Honourable Bill English, when he spoke to um, a group of IPANS um, public servants back in February, he talked about public servants needing to develop a tolerance for uncertainty. But he didn't talk about blind faith. He talked about a tolerance for uncertainty, which I read as innovation and, and um, being prepared to do some different things. But understanding the parameters of that, understanding what does measurement look like, how are we going to evaluate the, f the effectiveness of what we do. And the conference I was at earlier today um, uh, is called Our Place, and it's over at Te Papa, and it was jointly hosted by Inclusive New Zealand, uh, Inspiring Communities, and, um, and, and the Bee Institute. And the conversations they had this morning, it started with a woman by the name of Tia Nung, who's an Associate Professor of uh, Child Development and Urban Leadership in Boston, and about to take up a role in Harvard University. And she talked about the being a Vietnamese um, refugee, being landed in a, in a US um, context and, and a United States community in a very organised and managed way in the early 1970s as a consequence of the war and talked about the lack of connectedness to community and that how that impacted on their ability to be who they were and to connect with the communities that were most important to them. And she was followed by the principal of Berenpool School who talked about the journey they were going through, about inclusiveness <coughs> and about engagement with the students who, who were um, a great range of ethnicities and a great range of capabilities. Uh, we then had a young man with cerebral palsy in a wheelchair who talked about the inclusiveness of uh, of needing to have a say in what people did for him and what he owned and that he wanted to be known. He was a teacher. He didn't want to be known as the teacher in the wheelchair. He wanted to be known as a great teacher. And then the third set of speakers was um, two leaders, one out of the Mungo Mob and one out of Black Power. And, if, and they said, look, if you want to talk about hard, hard to reach families, then you're talking about us. And so it struck me that today, very much the conversation is about are we talking to the right people in the right way? If we're looking for evidence of effectiveness, are we having the right level of engagement? Are we talking to the people who really know how it, it feels and know what the impact looks like for them? Or are we doing it to them, doing it around them, doing it um, in a different way? And so for us, as we move into this new phase with our investment strategy, when we determine how the evidence is going to justify the investment. I think there's a real lesson for us in terms of ensuring that we have the right conversations, we engage in the right way, and we talk in the most effective way we can. Um, I was cleaning up some papers the other day and I came across a quote that I'd, I'd had for some time ago that I'd, wrote, that I'd written down. It just struck me that it was very appropriate for the things we're trying to do. And it's by the German philosopher um, Nietzsche, who says, be careful lest in fighting the dragon, you become the dragon. 
And I think if ever we wanted a, um, a theme for going forward and changing the way we do things, let's ensure that we create the opportunity for things to be better, to be more effective, but not create another level of um, issue and anxiety and um, overlay that in fact gets in the way of what we're trying to achieve together. Thank you. Kia ora anō tātou. Um, I think I'm here to speak from a Māori lens. Is that right? <laughs> I'm looking at you. Okay, to quite tēnā. Um, <laughs> so I think we get to see some of the impacts um, and be able to validate through evidence some of the wins that we have um, or, or may not have. Um, but one of the things I think is fair to say is that we are working in a way that we've never worked before. Um, and the fact that government ministers and NGOs can see an iwi boundary, and when I say see the boundaries that we have defined, as opposed to different lines being drawn um, of longitude and latitude across MAP and that's your community. I think that's a real significant um, change um, to be actually seen as these are the ones that work this way and we don't have to worry about our neighbours that historically we've never worked with and actually they've got more raru going on than us, so... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so we're allowed to work in our own space. I think what's been really hard is um, measuring in, um, marae, healthy marae, and, and this is one of the things that clearly come through with um, our iwi is, you know, whose evidence and where do we get the support to actually be monitoring and evaluating our own programmes of what we would determine could be successful. Um, Given that Māori have so many faces now, you know, um, they're just not... Uh, you often find that some of our people will go away and get trained at a practitioner level on te whare tapawha and te pai mahutonga, and there's an assumption that our own people want to engage with that stuff. Um, actually, some of them don't. Some just want to get down with the business and get the service and get the hell out of there. Um, others really don't know where to start. So it's actually understanding the multiple facets of Māori and where they're actually at. Um, I think there's research for us, and we've really struggled to find research that's relevant to us. So there's lots of research out there um, for, for other programmes around the world. And there's some research there for Māori, particularly in um, traditional Māori parenting. But... Um, we don't see an investment that follows that research around good practice. So, um, this is my boss, by the way, this person here. <laughs> um, so one of the big questions we have is around measurement and um, investment. So if you think of uh, marae being the last bastion points where Māori culturally and within their um, society exist, right? It's a place where, as whānau, so if you go iwi, iwi is like your unfertilised eggs and your puku. Your hapu is when you become impregnated. And your whānau literally means to give birth. So automatically when your children are born, they're born into a whānau, a hapu, and then a larger iwi, okay? And then what you have is an iwi entity that sits out the side and that iwi entity manages your asset and engages with the crown. Can you see the disconnect? Mm -hmm. mm, mm. And legally, as government, we actually have to engage with um, the legal entity. So some of the research what we're really looking forward to is potentially in the future, how do we continue to work with whānau, hapu and iwi, yet work with this other group that have a mandate to speak on behalf um, to, to bring those threads into alignment. Um, but going back to the marae scenario, is when we looked across Te Taitokero and I asked a number of questions around how much investment goes into marae, there was very few. And we often wonder as iwi if there was any investment at all that went into marae, 
given that we are a real large service of work and income, whether or not we would actually need the social services that exist in our communities for us now. So um, just just kai o te away, just food for thought. Um, but yeah, we've got to get right down for Māori, right down to the grassroots, and that would be inside Māori structures, and your first place would be Marae. Thank you very much. You've now heard from our illustrious panel, uh, and you've got a rare opportunity to have some of the finest minds in evaluation address the questions that you've got. So, uh, who would like to start? Um, <laughs> we really welcome the, um, the, the revolution and the focus on outcomes. Um, it will, of course, be expensive, and we're interested to know whether, well, two things. One is whether there will be funding available specifically for upskilling and, and getting the resources necessary to comply, and two, whether um, there will be guidance in terms of IT systems for collecting and managing data. Um, the answer is yes, and um, capability money is really important. Um, we've spent quite a lot of money over the last three years. Whether we've spent it well or not is a question mark for me. Um, some of it has been, others perhaps not so well. Certainly in, the cap in terms of the capability investment resource, which is the money specifically targeted solely for capability development, for the year ahead, that'll be focused very much on, um, on helping organisations get the right focus around an evidence platform for what they do and looking at some of the IT solutions that need to underpin that. Um, in terms of the, the broader spend, um, I think as we, as we go forward, we need to think about when government purchases things, um, the things get redefined. So it's not just a, mat a matter of buying an activity. Um, we, are, we are buying an outcome, a result, and we're buying a capability in the organisation. So I think over time you'll see funding move more to be more holistic and inclusive. Um, that would be certainly my intention under the revolution that we're trying to keep under control. No one else is asking, so I'll ask the question that's been going around in my head. Since that little frisson of disagreement occurred on the panel, uh, about whether it's better to focus on one thing or, or several. Uh, I mean, I went to the, uh, the presentation from the police on the Phillipstown program, and there's no way you could pick one aspect of that community and focus on that. You had to do the lot. But I can also see that in some cases, in complex systems, it is better to try and find the one thing that's <coughs> going to shift the system. And, you know, in some, it, it, you can think of national um, interventions, for example, focusing on speed for traffic, focusing on insulation for houses, focusing on vaccination for health. Um, I wonder if the panel could comment a bit more on that. You know, what, where do you come down on this? Uh, is it better to focus on a whole system or decide on uh, one particular element, try that, see if it works? So I think, just to, to elaborate a bit more, if you, if, if you don't um, focus on one thing collectively, chances are that every agency is going to pick a different part of the s complex system, fiddle with it, and you could actually be working uh, against each other. Seems how I was the provocative one to start this one. And I guess one thing I want to clarify, it di I didn't mean that you only do one or two things, uh, but I do think, and I, I still believe that if you want to get particularly a collaborative to work together, and you have 15 priorities, you will probably achieve nothing. So I still would stick by the view that you probably can have more of an impact if you go after one or two priorities. Then I mean, you stop doing everything else, but it just focuses people's efforts if they can get behind what you might call back pocket outcome. What can everyone can pull out their back pocket and go, yeah, I know what we're going after. So I haven't changed my view. I would still say there is value in selecting one or two priorities and going after those. Um. Yeah, I think that um, one of the challenges is that um, when you're trying to work out what that thing is, um, that there are always uh, competing um, perspectives. Um, uh, from a, I guess because I'm sitting here as the Pacific Pacifica uh, person, one of the things that I'd be quite interested in, and I'm sure my colleagues would be as well, is how in that conversation about when you're prioritizing that one thing, can you get a, 
a complementary conversation about how that one thing would break down to address the perspective such as the Pacific or other perspectives. So I think you do you do need to come to an agreement that there are some universal issues that together as a group you need to work on, but that in the implementation or the rolling out or the focusing within that, you, you have to make space for the diversity within. So that's the thing that I'm yeah, sort of trying to figure out how best to do that. Um, I guess what, what I would say, and, and thanks for bringing us back to that um, conversation, because I think it's important, um, you know, what, with the example I was giving earlier was around the, the collective impact uh, uh, model of um, Equally Well, um, and the, sh the idea that um, we, we have a shared outcome, um, but the players can um, all do one thing in their particular sphere of influence. Um, and even today, um, somebody was saying to me, um, oh, I really want to get involved, but in fact, a couple of people have come up to me and said, I really want to get involved, but what could I do? And, and we chat about that, and, and then they're, they're thinking, actually, yes, I could, I could do that part of the, the jigsaw. Um, but I do um, also agree with what Louise says about, you know, you do need to focus in on, on several areas, and that's the other thing we've been thinking about in the collaborative is, is whether we have what we might call action pushes. So this year, we're particularly focused on this influencing strategy or and this particular change area um, to make a difference so that people feel they're, they're um, acting around one area even though they might be doing the odd thing um, which they can achieve. So I, I think it is really hard when you've got these sorts of wicked issues um, and double is when you look at all of it that's why you go oh it's just too hard and you put it back. So mm -hmm. I think trying to find ways in which you can pick that off and also it's mo so important to share the wins when you do get change to help people think, well, it's worth doing my bit of this jigsaw because I can see change happening over here and we need to help everyone see the difference they're making in their part. <coughs> I think traditionally government has, has asked for too much and has not paid sufficient to justify the delivery of it. Um, and, and what you'll see in the future, I hope, is that those one or two things or half a dozen things that are really important get focused upon Clearly there's peripheral things that are achieved as a consequence of that, but we've got to be far more targeted and focused on what we do. You have seen government attempt to do that with the better public service targets, because at least there's 10 areas which signify where government priority lies. You raise the interesting dilemma that we have of, of agencies focusing on different things, and that's a real challenge. And, and within the BPS target space, there is collective government effort, so it's not the targets don't belong to one agency and not another. There is a lead agency. But it's important that we get really focused upon that, I think. And, um, and in future, I think you'll find we have a far more targeted approach to what is needing to be achieved as opposed to a, a blanket well-being. From our experience, we've had um, obviously five outcomes. Um, each outcome has two indicators, so that makes ten indicators. Each indicator has three strategies so we could go on for days as to <laughs> how much stuff we have had there and you know they harvested ideas from the community so what we've done is we've looked at each of the three strategies we've said is there enough evidence to make this work is there enough evidence there that looks like it could be a success for the community if not is there enough rationale if we haven't been able to find the evidence, is there enough rationale and go and build it with the community? Um, and then what you end up with, or what we've ended up with, is basically one, <coughs> a one strategy for each of our indicators. And then we've narrowed that down to, we're only focusing on five right now, as agreed by our partners. Yeah. So Murray, in 10 years time, what would success look like with, um, with what you're doing? And the spend, since you, well, I think I'm there, not you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and with the spend, and, and like, uh, you're in charge of the dollars. In 10 years time, what does success look like for Ontario? Yeah, thanks for the easy question, Donovan. Um, <laughs> um, in 10 years time, um, I, 
I would like to think we're spending less, um, not because government's getting tighter, but we because we need to spend less. Um, because at the moment we don't spend enough to do the things we need to do, and we're not focused enough on the areas of target that um, we spend well. Um, I mean, in an ideal world, we, we wouldn't be doing what we do. The reality is we're always going to be doing that to some extent. Um, my hope is that in the future, and, and Sheridan's um, work in Make It Happen to Hiku is, is, um, is a good example of this, that actually the, the model in the future will be um, people other than government making some of those core decisions about what's needed, about where the resources go, and about what success looks like for them. So um, in 10 years' time, I, I can't predict where the money will be. Um, I don't know if I'll be here to see it, um, but um, depends how we go with the revolution, I guess. But um, <laughs> um, what we will see, I'm sure, is that people having greater ownership and greater control over what happens in their own space. Any other? I suppose I should remind you, I can't remember who said it, but the comment was that uh, a revolution is simply a way of replacing one tyranny with another. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so call it evolution. Rename it. Do we have a um, <clears throat> my questions for Sheridan. I'm afraid I, I couldn't quite see some of your slides. Um, and something's haunting me. Your your purpose is um, long term whānau well being. Could you just give us some indicators as to what, what are your measures for whānau well being? We have five outcomes, and those outcomes are linked to all tohiku wellbeing. Um, so for argument's sake, one of the outcomes is peaceful, prosperous and progressive. An indicator in that space is early learning, so an increase in ECE rates across tohiku. Another indicator is the increase in household income. Um, let's be real. Um, increasing household income is going to be a real challenge. Okay. Um, so what we've looked at with the task force is investing in um, what we call collect a collective impact project that, so can I, I'll just use this example, Murray. Um, MSD have co-invested with Iwi to put an orchard um, in the far end of the north for three schools as well as Tipuni Kōkere, TPK, our DHBs, a range of efforts going into Marakai. Mm -hmm. So we know at some point we won't have food in schools anymore when that policy changes, and there's already been some indicators, and we'll lose the benefits of our children um, being able to learn. But what we'll also see is that the price of fruit and other things will really impact on individual households. So we looked at food security, um, and supporting Fano to be more um, self-reliant and resilient. So our co-investment into that space is to allow our children to always have fresh fruit, i.e. an orchard, um, but also to have a food security plan across their community and have that written into their curriculum. Um, in effect, we hope that that will reduce the costs of around $40 a week of expenses into the homes on the peninsula. So while we might not be able to increase household income, we can decrease everyday spend. Mm. It's a way of addressing poverty in a different way and building in education. Any other? Can I just uh, add back? That's a wonderful example of how um, we need to get away from spending thinking about the money is to contribute to the to the outcomes regardless rather than thinking about what it's for so whilst um we get um focused in on what a ministry does and what it can fund and what it can't fund whereas if we think about the outcome we're trying to achieve then it allows a particular ministry to fund for that outcome rather than even if it's paying for an orchard and, you know um and i think that's a great example if we could do more of that um i think that would make um you know it, it, things much more effective really. Can I ask a question of the panel? I think um, it, it, it was Louise who made the point that in fact we need continuous improvement. And in many ways I think she justified that by reminding us that most of the people that deliver policy have far more
capability for variability in how they do it through her wonderful chart. We've had discussions on the, that we're quite biased in things we select, and I, I think bias in operations, if we look at court processes for Maori, young Maori men, we, we, we can see that. We've got huge issues in whether we've created artificial units of the population, whether in fact in public policy we know what a whānau is, is an interesting question. And in many ways, once we start using units of the community to be agents of policy, we, we have to shape them uh, ourselves. And, and, and so I wonder, and, and of course we refer to the Pacific, I remember it was a, a, a very strong-willed Samoan woman, Louisa Crawley, that stopped Statistics New Zealand publishing the Pacific Island as its target and introducing individual island um, origins of people. Uh, we see that to what extent, if we recognise in fact that all policy is really just an experiment because of the, the lack of it, real complete information we have, how can we give faith as uh, people who evaluate policy that ministers of the Crown, that the governments, when they get advice, um, that they ought to believe it? If on the other hand we're saying, hey, this is just an experiment after all because we don't know that much about the people that we're telling you you ought to do things to. So just a quick, it, it, it seems to me there's a real tension. And Murray's re revolution is, is one way to get it because we then believe that we've arrived from high with perfect answers at times, as I think Roger Douglas delivered to us, and so we don't challenge for quite a long time what we've got. But, but there's a, 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 it must be immensely hard for people like Murray at the pit face of being able to say to ministers, yes, you can trust my advice, and on the other hand, but there's a whole lot of uncertainties around how we deliver that. How do we frame that uncertainty that we genuinely ought to have in ways that aid policy development and help formulate better policy than just simply stop people wanting to talk to analysts and evaluators because they'd only give them information that's got limitations and qualifications. So just a, a small, simple question. <laughs> <laughs> That's the most exciting question I've heard today. Thank so. you, Sharon. <laughs> so, um, do you remember back in the day um, with school teachers, they were trained, say, in Auckland University, and they all had to go and do section out in rural communities? Yeah. I believe you should not be able to write policy unless you have lived locally. <coughs> okay? I believe that um, there's a certain amount of cultural competency um, that you need to acquire. Um, and I'm, I'm really heartened um, at how many people are on that journey and doing it. Um, but in order to write policy, you kind of have to be able to see the lens from the community. And you know, for us in Tehiku, we're the furthest from the king's table. So, you know, we just, we get to set the spray. <laughs> and we're not really attractive um, to come and stay with all our, our deprivation. Now, I have awesome work colleagues that come up to Kaitaia and love visiting, um, and they get a feel, and I know that when they come up, after a while they go back and they really work for the cause and they work for the kaupapa. Um, but I also meet a whole heap that have never been into rural places or isolation. So I think that should be pretty much a, um, a standard that you must go out to the regions. Things are dirt in your fingernails. Uh, yeah. Absolutely right. And um, you know, I've been in government now for three and a half years and I've developed a, a deep respect actually for policy people which um, replaced my previous cynicism. Um, <laughs> um, I, was, I was quite a vocal complainant about government for 10 years in the NGO sector. Surprisingly, they actually offered to employ me. Maybe it was to shut me up, I don't know. Um, and, and one of the things I used to say regularly was that the conversations happen too late. And by that I meant people in policy would decide what um, issue they needed to resolve, they would decide how they were going to resolve it, and then they would seek to buy that solution from the NGO sector. Um, and often it would, f it would go bad, and often we'd get um, asked or challenged as to why that had happened, and the problem was if they'd talked to us earlier, then the solution they developed may not have been the solution, but actually the problem may not have been the right problem either. Mm. And so um, if, if I have any influence in that process, it's to say to our guys, as Sharon has just said, go and experience it, go and talk to the people who know what it feels like on the ground, and the policy as a consequence would be far better as a result. Um, 
I, I guess I keep I keep thinking that it's really my, my sense of policy is that it needs to not get in in the way, but it needs to guide. So I guess it needs to be um, a route map, but and doesn't have to be the be all and end all of everything. So it's up to us in the sector to breathe life into that and to make sure we communicate when it is actually a, clearly a barrier to that. So for me. I look out for whether it's a barrier, if it is, we're looking at um, good information to make that change. Um, but also then it, it can't, we can't wait and while, wait for policy whilst we're trying to make change. So we just have to be careful about setting policy up as the kind of panacea um, uh, of everything really. Um, but I do think that we don't do enough um, evaluation of um, policy implementation and that is, that is key. So to answer your question, if, if it is uncertain, if, if we are experimenting, then we need to evaluate the impact, intended and un, unintended consequences of any policy we make. Um, I think that's a really good <coughs> question, um, Len, largely because um, what it makes me think about is uh, in the evaluation uh, research evidence to action world, there is this kind of desire to know everything and you can't know everything there's a certain amount of humility that comes with uncertainty recognizing that you can only collect so much in so much time for so much you know for a particular person within the within the constraints and so um, part of the process that you go through in, in doing this whole evaluating for action is learning um, what you can and cannot do, what you do and do not know, um, and who to go to, um, who you need to talk to, why you need to talk to them in that way. And that takes a lot of humility to be able to do that. Um, if you're working um, and you're wanting to do a contract that requires you to go out and, and talk to a range of different providers, a range of different peoples, and you don't have a team that has all the skills and competencies to do that, then you have to say that up front and work out how you're going to get it. And if you can't get it, to let it go. That, that's not always easy. So I think it's a good thing to raise. I think I come at this from a slightly different perspective. I'm, I'm really taken by Len's point about this notion of probability. And we, we don't tend in evaluation to talk about um, the likelihood of a particular outcome. We like to sort of categorise stuff as saying it's going to work or it's not going to work, rather than saying actually the probability of this is pretty high or this is a bit of a risky one, which, which leads me to think of um, sometimes imagining the way we spend our money on children as a bit of a sort of an investment portfolio. And within that portfolio, you might have some real high risk bets where you're not confident. So if the, the probability of getting a good outcome is a bit low, but if it works, you're gonna get some really nice big <coughs> returns. And also in your portfolio, you might have some real dead certs that you know that if you do them, they will consistently give you some good results. And so thinking about the billions that we spend on children and having a mixed portfolio within which we have probabilities of getting some really good results and somewhere it's a bit more risky is a slightly different way of taking your idea of probability. <laughs> Yes, I think research doesn't actually give us certainties. So, for example, with the new enthusiasm for predictive modelling, say we design our populations into quartiles, then each quartile ought to have some chance of getting whatever it is. And the probability of getting it ought to be based on our expectation that, 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 that the, the, the payoff is less or more. But if we don't actually give ev every, sign, every individual with a probability greater than zero, we're getting into the inequity issues that Helen was talking about, and we're also forgetting it's still an experiment. Because even our predictive modelling is still actually just an experiment. And, and I think it's really important that we retain that statistical view of, of, of error in everything we actually do. Just a, just a thought. Can I give one example from my own experience? In the 1970s, we got this wonderful household budget survey where we knew for the first time the incomes of men and women in households. And until then, Prime Minister Muldoon, we used to have this single income family tax rebate, spouse tax, re re tax rebate, because we knew that low income families were those where the husband only worked and had low income. Unfortunately, of course, what happened when we had our analysis, we discovered that the lowest income families actually had two earners. And so that until uh, the policy change in 1978, all the policy instruments were targeted at completely the wrong families. Uh, and I think that's true of so much of our policy that we, we've got risks. In that case, it was a wonderful, beautiful example, and I'm sure not everything is like that. But th there's a whole sense we ought to be opening everything up for thinking and reflection. Well, can I just thank Mihi Nui Kia Koto.
ka whaka marama, ka whaka tika, tō māti mātou whakaro. Uh, thank you very much for, for enlightening, for challenging, for make, strengthening our own thinking today in this panel of these extraordinary um, brave thinkers and people with, it, with incredibly rich experience. And I just, if we can just thank them um, for clear to